Hey guys, this is a preface, a pre-introductory. I'm filming, I'm filming, I'm so old. I'm recording this after I've done the whole video. Guys, this is the most boring numbers-oriented presentation I've done yet. Don't stop watching this video till you get to this part. It's towards the back half of the video. I'm trying to change your life. I'm trying to change how you think about real estate. I'm trying to... I'm trying to get you to stop thinking like a poor person who's completely controlled by the system and to take control of your own life. You gotta control your own emotions. You have to control your purchase emotions, but this can change your life. We're gonna head into the video now. Good luck. Well, good Saturday morning, everybody. It's Dave coming to you from the paddock here in Southern Maryland. I'm smoking a little bit of uh, my Mad Fiddler Flake. I had a little bit left. I had about a bowl's worth in here. It laid out all night, but for about half a bowl, seems worth it. I'm smoking it in uh, the Meerschaum I purchased myself from Meerschaum Market. I love the carving. Um, I love the size. It's a little bit bigger. And then when I bought it from Meerschaum Market, I had them send me the church warden stem to go with it. I like the uh, the coolness of a much larger meerschaum, and I like the coolness of the smoke of the church warden stem. Well, guys, this is uh, episode five of our investment series. I have created the uh, playlist for the investment series, so the last four episodes are already in there. And then the episode five today will get uploaded as soon as we're done. This is our You Are Here. And we are here. We're ending our medium risk series today. We are talking about real estate. So when um, I'm sensing that most of you, if you want to talk about buying real estate, you're buying it either as a primary home, primary residence, as they call it, or as a rental investment property or as a second vacation home. So I'm going to stick to the real estate to the uh, residential real estate of this conversation. There's an entire different world out there called the commercial real estate market. Uh, we're not going to talk about it as part of this series. I believe it is a dying, dangerous game right now. Most of our cities have standing vacancy rates in their commercial real estate that are at nightmarish proportions and getting worse. I know D.C. feels like a ghost town when you go downtown during the day. And I haven't looked it up yet, but I've heard that the Manhattan vacancy rate is running somewhere around 35%, which is 10 times normal. So people are having, companies are having trouble getting people to come back into their jobs in the cities. If they're demanded to do that, they just start looking for another job. So commercial real estate is a problem, and I think... It could be an anchor on our economy, but certainly doesn't need to be anchor on our investment strategy. So if you want to invest in commercial real estate, God bless you, but um, I'm not going to address it here. There's another easy way to invest in real estate called REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust, R-E-I-T's, REITs. I don't touch them. I don't really know anything about them. So we're not going to address it here. So basically, you have commercial real estate, residential real estate, and REITs. And we're only going to address one leg of that stool. So um, let's head into the discussion of residential real estate. So again, I put real estate in the medium risk zone. Mainly because the market, again, determines how much your house is worth and not you or I. We basically have no input to it. And we can make it as good a shape as it can be in, and we can make it as marketable as possible, but we really don't drive the value of the home. And we can finish the basement, make sure it has good curb appeal, make sure it has a modern roof. 
you know, make sure it's painted right and has good floor coverings and a nice kitchen and stuff like that. But that'll dictate what your house is worth in the market you're embedded in, but it does nothing to do with the market you're embedded in. So just be careful. The other reason is yellow is of all the products we've talked about, you need the longest runway for this to work. And unless you're a flipper and that's a dangerous business and I don't want to talk about it here. When you purchase a piece of property, you're going to need probably several years for it to appreciate to the point where it's actually made you significant money when you sell it. You know, we're not looking to break even on investments. The other thing we should talk about is whether a, your private residential home is an asset or a liability. Most of us are dead wrong and consider it an asset. Usually our private homes cost us money to own them. And by the time you sell it, you might feel like you made a lot of money, but if you calculate all the payments you made and all the repairs you made, it was an alligator every month you owned it and made payments, by the way. You may break even, but few people make real money on selling their home versus what they actually put cash into it. So in the in the financial world, a piece of uh, real estate that you live in is considered a liability. Some loan companies will let you put the value of your home minus anything you owe on it on the asset side. But just know it's an alligator. Every time you buy a piece of property that you live in, it's essentially going to take money out of your wallet every month. So therefore, it's a liability. So if you're going to invest it, if you're going to invest in real estate for investment purposes, and I've done that. I've got a couple. I've got a few pieces of real estate. The question is, can you rent it out at a monthly rate compounded annually actually that actually pays for itself will it make the payment i mean the full piti payment the principal interest taxes insurance so if you have a mortgage on it it needs to make the payment if you pay real estate taxes on it which you do does it make the real estate tax payment you probably carry some sort of general insurance on it does it pay for that and then you, your repairs and all that So you need to be able to sell it where it's not an alligator. I mean, I'm sorry, you need to buy it at a point where you can rent it out. So the rental of income pays, it pays for everything. You don't want to be writing checks. You don't want your rental properties to be alligators or there's no way you can get a second or third one. If all your property is eating money instead of providing money, that's, that's a hard business to get into. And doing that and hoping that appreciation actually turns it around for you that doesn't turn around the cash flow. That just turns around the asset value. And then you got to sell it. And um, does the market go the way you want it at the timeline you want it to sell? And if not, you got to keep paying those bills. So just make sure if you get into the real estate investment business that you do it at a, in a way that it pays for itself. Otherwise, you're going to probably be in real trouble. All right, we're going to go to the screens here in a minute, but there's a couple of things we should talk about. One are, um, you need to understand if there's a homeowner association associated with your prospective property, even if it's land. I'll give you the example. I own two lots. I mean, it has houses on it, but both lots owe homeowners association dues, even that middle of nowhere, Wyoming. So... Just make sure that if you're buying a piece of property, is it broken into how many lots? Is it one legal lot or two or three? And are there homeowner association dues ascribed annually to each lot? It would be, a, you know, if it's 500 bucks or 1000 bucks a year per lot and you're buying three lots, but there's nothing on it, but you get assessed $3,000 a year for HOA fees anyway. Um, that could be a real problem to your budget if you didn't know about it. So always check your HOAs. How are they assessed? And then how much are they per lot? Guys, this is one of those look at me. Look out. Stop what you're doing. Look at me. 
go get a pre-approval letter. Go to your lending institution, whichever one you feel most comfortable with or you have the best uh, relationship with, and get a pre-approval letter. This is a letter that says this bank agrees to finance you for the purchase of real estate up to X dollars with X percent in our interest rates and X dollars down. It gives you a maximum buying op opportunity. The reason you need to do it, this is not fun, right? This is where you just get, you know, you get anal probed by the, you know, by the sphincter police that are at the bank. And it's not fun. But if you can get a pre-approval pre letter, that way if you come across that, that unicorn piece of property, you're like, how the hell can this be this price? You showing a pre-authorization letter moves you to the top of the offer list. All right, if you go there as just some dumbass donkey who has no no relationship, you haven't even started the, the financing process, you either need to be an all-cash buyer or you need to have a pre-authorization letter. All right, Because if you find that great piece of property at a great price, you're probably not the only one who's going to be interested in it. So all cash, no contingencies, they win the battle every time. Those are the me's of the world, right? I bring no contingencies and I bring cash to purchase this. All right, so I'm who you're up against when you do this. Um, and then if you bring no contingency pre-authorized, you're number two in the queue. If you're pre-authorized but you got to sell your current home or you have other contingencies, then you're third on the list. And if you have contingencies and no pre-approval, you're probably, you know, you they might not even pay attention to you. Go get a pre-authorization letter. It's not fun, but might as well get it done now. A couple of other concepts before we go to the screens and graphs. If you put less than 20% down, you will be assessed private mortgage insurance, PMI. It adds several hundred dollars to your payments. So just be aware of that. Sometimes there's a trade-off. Well, I can't save the 20%, or as I save the 20%, the housing price ran away from me. I don't want to do that again. So I'm going to go ahead and just put less than 20% down. So just be aware that should you put less than that down, you're going to get assessed a pretty big fee called PMI. No way to get out of it. The other concept is interest rates and points. Points, some banks will make you Prepay interest at the time of the transaction when you close. So they'll offer you 6% 30 year fixed at two points. All right, so you're buying down the interest rate to 6%. For them to offer you that, you got to put some cash into the deal, not considered part of your down payment, just part of the closing costs. So you always want to understand the interest rate and what you got to pay up front to get it. Points. Right? It doesn't say interest rate pay down. It's another one of those lingo things. Points. It's how they, up till now, they've been offering low interest rates for zero points. That's kind of gone in the market now. And we're going we're gonna to look at the market as it exists today here in a minute. So when we go to the charts, we're going to be talking about uh, mortgages and how you can get out of them quicker and for a lot less money. So we're going to be talking about 30-year fixed, 15-year fixed, and 10-year fixed mortgages. We are not going to be discussing adjustable rate mortgages or teaser rate mortgages part of this series. Um, I'm simply going to tell you, don't do it. More people have lost their houses because they got into a teaser rate and didn't understand it or got into an arm and didn't understand it. And their payments went up by a thousand or two thousand dollars in their third year or their fourth year. I don't know if we're in a declining interest rate market or uh, an, an increasing interest rate market. And you know what? Nobody does right now. If you think we're going to have much higher interest rates or mortgage rates five years from now, then an arm um, does not make sense because <laughs> it'll unlock and go to the higher rate. If you think we're in a severely declining, you can re you can re um, mortgage, you know, at that time. But you're taking a risk. You're taking a gamble that if you go into an arm, you're gambling that you believe market rates are going to go down substantially, 
They may or may not. If they do, there's other ways to accomplish it. It'd be my advice. I do not entertain arms or teaser rates. That was my thoughts to you. So guys, the classic location, location, location. Let's talk about location for a minute. Where are you thinking about buying? You really need to look at the history of the median housing prices in the area, even by zip code. It's easy to do, they're all over the internet. Because some places are just economy resistant. Jackson Hole, Wyoming is one of them. Aspen, Colorado is another one. Waterfront property in, in uh, South, Miami, uh, South Miami, South Florida is another one. Um, you know, so Mountain View, Waterfront, um, typically like Manhattan, Long Island, Jackson. These are relatively, it doesn't really matter what the economy does, the prices tend to stay stable or go up, right? And on the converse, Las Vegas got pasted a couple of times. Phoenix got pasted. Um, there are a lot of cities that are very, very, very dependent on the economy. If the economy falls, real estate will fall as well. So just be aware. Do the research on, I mean, literally in the city, state, then city, then neighborhood or zip code of what does the price look like over the last 20 or 30 years. And if you see great fluctuations, you just know you could be buying, you could be buying at the bottom, right? I doubt it given today's market. But you probably, in today's market, you're probably buying at the top of a market. And it may continue on, but if you're, not, if you're in a cyclical market and you're buying at the top, you may take a five or ten year hurt. Um, and again, if your runway's long enough, who cares? But if you take a ten year hurt and you need money back, you wanted to sell it in two or three years, you might not want to look at it you know, doing real estate or at least not doing real estate in that market. All right, I think we'll go to the charts. All right, so we'll just come to the screens and look at PMI, private mortgage real quick. And what it basically says, lenders will require you if you put less than 20% down, you're going to be required to do it. And then how much, right? So let's go talk about the cost. So this is pretty sluggish. I wouldn't trust this part, okay? 1.5% to 2.25% of the entire mortgage. So on a $200,000 loan, I don't know who gets $200,000 loans anymore. You're going to at least two grand or 166. So, I mean, you're probably looking at a couple hundred bucks between two and $300 a month extra. And if, you're, if your loan is $400,000, we're going to talk about that in a minute then you're probably looking at more like an extra four or $500 a month. So that's why PMI, it can actually hurt. So the next thing I want to talk about, this comes right from Fred. This is a federal database. So if you don't know about Fred, the federal uh, research, I don't even know what it's called. Anyway, it's Fred. It's put out by the St. Louis Reserve Bank. It's considered uh, sort of the industry standard for research on data of the economy. Here you see median house prices sold. And this is, this is uh, for the entire United States. So it's not too effective if you're looking in a city. But what I wanted to show you is that it was 479.50 a year and a half ago. And today it's running around 417 grand. I don't know if this is a blip or I don't know if this is setting a new trend down. Um, sometimes they'll say you can extend this line out and maybe it's going to fall down a little more. I don't know. I don't know if housing prices are going to go up or down. That's not my point. I'm just saying just be aware of what the median prices are so that when you start pricing properties out, you know, are, they, are you woefully out of, out of the median price? The next thing I want you to be understanding of is the, how, the inventory. How many houses are for sale in the United States today? 
and you can see a general decline for a long time and then relatively stable and it's come down and, and right now <clears throat> we're in a downturn because there are fewer houses on the market than there have been in the last several years um i just think people are a little scared of interest rates so they don't want to get out of the one they're in and then get into a higher interest rates and pay more for the, the same valued house they're in now so inventory is fairly low i think that's what's keeping prices high the economy's a little bit off people aren't feeling very good about their jobs or their their income um, but you're not seeing housing prices come off too much I think it's because the inventory is low. So if there's a lot of choice out there, I think you'd see prices coming down. The last thing I wanted to show you is this is my an example of a place that is just defies a gravity. Um, this is it has a coastside where my my Wyoming home is. Um, it's not really why we bought it there. We bought it for what you see here. We bought it for the scenery and the wilderness and all that. But some places like Jackson just defy any sense when it comes to the market. So, you know, I don't know if you're in the market to look anywhere. I would start looking at places that show true price resiliency, regardless of what the economy is doing. Here's another source of data, Statistica, and this is just showing you average sales price of single family homes really for the last 12 years. And you see the blue line is condominiums. And the black line is single family homes. So I'm just showing you another data source if you wanna to go to it to do your own research. All right guys, so since the average per purchase price of a house in the United States is 417,000, I put it in right here and you can use a, there's a million of these places out there. I just happened to find bank rate this morning that talks about what are the mortgage rates. You know, the news is all over it. So here's what I did. I put in uh, the average price. I just left, they defaulted to 20% down. I don't know who's got $80,000 to put down. And then it's got this crazy credit score. So that's in a pretty amazing score. You only go to about 820 or 850. So this is the highest you can pretty, pretty much get. But I, I chose 30 year, 15 year and 10 year fixed. And I just want to show you what the rates come up as. So here, 10 year fixed, 5.375, 10 year, 15 year fixed, five, same rate. There's an arm. 30 year fixed at 6.2, 15 at 6.5. So you can see 15 years and 10 years are about 5.3, and your 30 years are running about 6.62 right now. And there are some that I found a little bit cheaper than that. But just get an understanding. And all I'm trying to do is show you what interest rates are for 30 year fixed, 15 year fixed, and 10 year fixed. Because that plays actually into what I want them. I really want you to get out of this video. So, guys, this is another stop the video moment and look at me. One of the biggest mistakes you're going to make as you go out to buy real estate is how much can I buy? And that discussion normally, it used to be they were talking about <coughs> value of the property. Now it's kind of like a car. They don't even want to <coughs> talk about the price of the car. They want to talk about your monthly payment. All right, and that's stupid and dangerous. They want to talk about how much you can afford and what they mean as a real estate market, a real estate agent, real estate broker is how much can you afford per month? And they, they calculate the maximum property price you can buy for that amount. And that might feel good. It might be emotional feel good for you but it is how the poor are kept poor and it's how they help you make really bad decisions and keep you in debt in debt slavery for the rest of your life i'm going to show you some alternative ways to think about mortgages all right because i want you out of your mortgage i want you debt free if you can get out of your mortgage if you can own your home outright 
It changes your personality. It changes your your state. It changes your state of relaxation. It changes how you interact with people. It removes a stress button from you that is unexplainable to someone who carries a huge mortgage. So I wanna, I wanna go in and show you some different options. So guys, I summarize what I'm about to show you in this chart over here, all right? But I'm, I wanna take you through some facts first. So I found this calculator.net today. I've not used it before, but it's a good one. I recommend you use it if you start talking about mortgages. So what you see here is you see that I've used 417,000, that's the median, a 30 year loan, and it's fixed at 6% because I, I found a couple. That means you got, so I'm assuming for now, let's say, I know some of you are already five or 10 years into your payments, but I'm starting out with a brand new purchase because the number actually will get better if you have less years to pay on it. But let's just do this 30 year loan, fixed interest, 60%, 6% at 30 years. And we're going to do this with normal payments, okay? No, nothing extra, all right? And that means your monthly payment will be $2,500. You'll end up paying $900,000 for that house. $483,000, that will be interest, okay? So that's, this is what most people would do. They would say, here's, here's the nightmare, all right, right here. How much can you afford? Oh, I can afford up to $2,500 a month. And they go, oh man, that's awesome because we can get you a 30 year fixed and you can afford up to a $420,000 home. And that gets you all excited. Okay. And this number, the higher you get it, obviously, the more you can buy. I want to show you something different. So if I can get you off the emotional nut of I need to buy something, I need to buy the most I can buy. Here, here you go, 417, same number, keep losing my cursor. 417, 15-year fixed, 525, 5.25. So you got a 15-year fixed. And I've been playing around with this, so I'm going to play around with it with you real time. Normal repayment, all right? Nothing new, calculate it. And now you'd be paying six hundred thousand for that house, and you'd have a payment of thirty three fifty two instead of twenty five hundred. All right, and you'd be paying that house off in fifteen years instead of thirty. Most people don't like to talk like this. Down here, though, is this is a key button: buy weekly repayment, because most of us get paid every other Friday. And so, if you pay your mortgage every other Friday, you'll actually make thirteen payments. But you won't even notice it because it's just coming out of your check. You just make it every other Friday. That means 26 instead of 12 in payments. So you're making 13 monthly payments instead of 12. All right. And if you do that, recalculate it. You now pay it off in 13 years, five months. So you've cut a year and some number of months off, and you've now paid 581,000 for this. And then the next one I want to I want to show you is repayment with extra. Okay. And instead of spending three 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 five two. You're going to make double payments, all right? Um, $6,700, basically, $6,704. We're going to recalculate that. You're going to pay this. I did this, something I did wrong. Oh, sorry. I did that totally wrong, which is good because now you can see. So I'm going to type the amount of your payment back in, which is 3352. Okay, I'm going to recalculate that. So you're making your payment twice. And what you see over here is you're going to pay it off in six years, right here, six years and one month. 
You're going to pay $487,000 for that house. So guys, I've shown you three options with three options each. And I want you to, this is an eye chart, but I want to show you how much you can save in life if you stop thinking about how much you should put in your monthly payment um, as the only variable. So here, this stripe is 30-year fixed at 6%. You're making just the regular payments, $2,500, because that's the max you can afford. It's going to take you 30 years to pay it off. You're going to pay almost a million dollars for that home. This is how most people get screwed because your house may not go from four hundred thousand to nine hundred grand. It might, um, but you can see how much you because you're calculating. Oh, it's oh my! I bought it for four hundred grand. I sold it for eight hundred. I'm in the clear when actually you spent nine hundred for it. Okay, same here. Thirty year fixed. Now you're doing those biweekly payments. So your monthly is twenty seven oh eight. And it cuts six years, five years and four months off your plan. And it cuts over 100000 off what you pay for it. All right. And then there's 30 year fixed with double payments. So you're paying five grand a month. And it cuts it down to nine years. So it takes a 30 year mortgage down to nine years. And you end up paying 540 grand for the house. All right, and there's the same with the 15 year. There's the same three options regular payments, 13 payments, double payments, and then 10 year. You can get a 10 year fix for about the same interest rate as your 15 year fixed. And if you were to make double payments, so that would be your payment, $44.74. But if you could make double payments, you would pay that house off in four years. And you would pay $467,000 for it. And so this is why it's so important to be aware of this stripe. Because if you can afford $5,000 a month payment, you don't want to go buy a, a $900,000 home and put all of that in unless you just want to double pay for it. Instead, buy a house that is half what you could buy and make double payments and get out from debt slavery 20 years old uh, ahead of time. Or if you could afford $5,000 payments, come all the way over here and we can get you out like, in nine years and you'd only pay 524 for it. So you get a 10 year loan making bi weekly payments. And maybe if you change your lifestyle, don't buy that new car, don't buy that RV, don't buy that boat, don't go on a really expensive vacations. Maybe you could pull this off and get debt slavery out away from you in the next three, four years, five years. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. This is the summary. <clears throat> I'm hoping this shows you how to think differently, how the the banks don't want to talk to you like this. The real estate agents don't want to talk to you like this because both have a vested interest in taking your maximum monthly payment and converting that into a maximum home value for you to purchase. That gives them the maximum commission upon sale and the maximum interest payment you've made to the bank. All right. So. <clears throat> Although both will seem like they're in your corner, they're fighting for you to do the absolutely stupidest thing you can do to maximize their revenue and their income. Um, so you have to take control of your emotions. You have to decide what you want. Do you want to get out of debt or do you want to live in this amazing home that you'll just never get paid off and um, it will always be an alligator and cause you stress? I'm begging you to try to at least attempt to have this conversation with yourself about what's the maximum I can afford per month. Really think about that. If I change my lifestyle, what's the max amount of money I can allocate to a house payment? And then maybe make that a double house payment instead. It will, it will severely shrink the purchase price 
that you're going to be uh, able to purchase. But we've shown that you could purchase something today and get out of it in four years and be debt free. It's, it's just a different way to think about it. This is how rich people get and stay rich, and this is how poor people get and stay poor. Debt slavery is real. Be careful of it. Do what you want, obviously. I mean, but hopefully this helps.